So it is uh, 601 on January 12th. I'm going to call the January 12th, 2021 regular governing board meeting of CV Fiber to order. Um, are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Uh, yeah, I have a little bit of uh, clerk stuff to report on. Okay, so um, let's put you after um, after last mile, if that's okay. Clerk report, and I Sound have uh, and I have one thing to add to the consent agenda, <clears throat> and that is the um, um, the payment of bills. There is also a bill from our clerk, so we have another clerk item to change there. So that's that's really the only thing. Uh, anything else? Okay. Um, moving along, uh, public comment. Does anybody have Tom, anything? Please. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom, I see you. Sorry, coming in just in the nick of time. Uh, I wanted to add that uh, um, potential motion about policy uh, somewhere after the uh, RFP discussion. Okay, yep, I, I did make a note of that earlier and uh, okay. yeah, we will we'll bring that up. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So public comment, does anybody have any comments on things that are not on the agenda that they would like to talk about? Okay, hearing none, uh, moving along. Consent agenda, I move that we approve the consent agenda uh, as presented. Second. Seconded by Siobhan, any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions or a roll call request? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thanks everybody. Uh, finance report. So I sent you a copy of the, the bank statement. I'm going to open that up right now. Um, so we still have some money left in the bank. I believe we still have some expenses um, that are uh, covered under the CARES Act funds. You can see some of the, the checks that have gone out. I also wanted to mention um, that I have not yet deposited the uh, the second CARES Act check. Um, I have it, uh, just it depends on when I'm gonna be able to get to the bank. Any uh, Any questions? Okay, moving right along then. Um, I apologize for the next um, the next two items. I neglected to update the times and kind of shift things around, but um, our next item is canvassing presentation by last mile. Um, so Nick, should I give you presenter rights? Uh, why don't you give it to Connor? I think he's gonna start out um, Connor. and oh, share okay. the presentation, I believe. Did everyone get the right. PDF? Uh, we we sent around. David, did you share that with folks? I did not. I, my right. bad. Slacker. You're just going to have to talk us boomers through how to share uh, our screen then. There it is. All right. Whenever you're ready. All right. All right, can Connor. You want... Can everybody hear or, me? Okay. Yeah, Connor. And Dave. Oh, okay. yep. You sound good. Excellent, thank you. So we're just going to um, kick things off here, and um, I want to introduce myself. I'm uh, Connor Casey. Uh, live right here in Montpelier, Vermont, and in, inside the CV Fiber area. Um, and with me are Nick Cherick uh, and David Babby Klein. Uh, in addition, we have a couple of our phone bankers just on hand um, who can chime in if they'd like at any point in this presentation. Uh, Teddy and Ted. Uh, Teddy is actually a city councilor in Barry City there, so he's well familiar with the area. And a lot of our canvassers and lit droppers are from central Vermont here. So um, they, uh, they, they, they had quite a connection to the, uh, the materials that they were doing here. Um, but I'm gonna throw it over to Dave to say a few words and then we'll get into the numbers a bit. Dave, you're on mute. Yep, I've got it. Uh, I'm Dave Babby Klein. Uh, I um, am living in Waitsfield right now. I uh, just moved from Newbury. And uh, we saw the problems with uh, broadband access. You know, we've been seeing it for decades. And during the pandemic, it really got laid bare. And so we uh, are excited to help close the gap with some of the 
the pieces that are missing in uh, in this process, which you are all working so hard to provide. Um, and in December, we began a survey of approximately 4,300 households in CV fiber territory, um, trying to find out, as you know, uh, people's internet needs for streaming, uh, their knowledge of emergency broadband, and also as an ancillary benefit, raise awareness about uh, CV fiber and the coming services along the routes in your area. Um, with coronavirus and the pandemic, it was a little bit different than it might have otherwise been where we would have really started going person to person. Um, and we prioritize matching using uh, state-of-the-art technology phone numbers to the addresses that were provided to us by David. Um, and we called through all, all of our matches uh, at least once. And I think, I believe we have now almost finished twice. Um, and we've supplemented that outreach with uh, digital outreach, which you've all helped with, and door-to-door -door literature drops. Um, and we have now seen over a thousand surveys uh, be completed. And we're very excited to have helped with, with, this, uh, with this project. Connor, over to you. All oh, right, and just digging into the numbers a little bit, um, all, all three of us actually have a background in political campaigns. Um, so when we were sort of asked to pivot from the door-to-door -door canvassing, um, th this was something we were a bit familiar with. Um, and what we did was took the data, the addresses uh, given to us by David and matched that up um, with some software that a lot of campaigns use using public records data um, to actually get uh, cell phones and landlines um, for just, a, just under 3,000 folks in the district here. Um, we put on eight phone bankers, all of whom have Vermont roots. Um, a lot of them are just coming off political campaigns. Uh, we've had a few from the world of VPIRG. Uh, so, so every one of them had a bit of experience doing this work. And uh, just a couple of things they found out right off the bat was uh, certainly these were a lot friendlier phone calls than they were used to. Um, and we can let them get into that at the end a little bit, but um, very, very, very high contact rate um, compared to what we're used to seeing. And I, I spoke to some colleagues who are running campaigns now. You know, if you're getting 10%, you're doing pretty well. And I, I think by the time the dust has settled, we'll be looking at 25% here, uh, which we, we think is pretty good. Um, so the calls made first and second round, 3,479. Uh, we're just wrapping up a bit of work. And on the second round, and this is folks who maybe we left a voicemail for before, but want to check in on again. Uh, we've probably got about a, 200 phone calls left on that. I think uh, Ted has been working on that a bit today. You. Yep. Oh, yes. Hello. Hey. Oh, sorry. Thought, thought, thought somebody jumped in with a question. Um, <laughs> the surveys we actually completed over the phone um, and how it worked was, um, I'll show you, we would have a script that we would use, um, but actually read over the phone and we would go online and use the CV Fiber website survey. Uh, 451, 58 people said they'd complete it later. Nick's number looks a little scary because you're thinking a lot of people hung up. Um, actually, out of the 113 uh, who refused, um, a good, good percentage of those had already taken the survey, either through front porch form or another means there. Um, so they were, they were very friendly, grateful for the call, but they didn't want to go through it again. And then we left a ton of voicemails just for folks uh, directing them either to the survey website link um, or to call a central phone number that we had and Nick would answer those. Um, we'll go into the lit dropping a little bit later, but we're looking at about 600 doors so far, um, mostly supplemental uh, to try to fill in the areas where we didn't feel we were performing as much as we would like to, um, but Nick will talk about that. Yeah, as far as the methodology, this is what the screen would look like. Um, we had a script under here. Um, so everybody was using the same script. They were trained not to read it like a telemarketer, because if I just say, hello, my name is Connor Casey, I'm calling from CV Fiber, uh, I think people would hang up. Uh, friendly, conversational, um, you knew a little bit about the people you were calling, you would know Sharon here was 59 years old and female. And then we also had information about what Sharon's address was, um, so we could plug that in. And again, the whole thing was trying to make it so, you know, it's conversational, it's not a telemarketer. Um, and we really found people weren't like hanging up or anything. So we were really happy with the way the phone bank went. 
Now, as we're dispatching people to the doors, we have a companion program. Um, what we use is the Voter Activation Network. Again, that's a political software. That has a mobile technology component to it called Minivan. So Minivan uses GPS technology and it would actually direct the person dropping literature door to door to make it easy enough. And then they could just check off the houses where the literature has been dropped there. And again, this was non-contact. Nick will go into that a little bit. Uh, but, but we were able to target that, target that and cut some maps um, to follow along with the potential routes there. Uh, so that ensured for a pretty high success rate. And we're still on doors the next uh, couple of days here. We're, we're still working on that. All right, and over to you, Nick. Cool. Um, so we began working doing some door-to-door -door outreach um, midway midway through the month. And this whole sort of project it's it's a it's a four-week. Uh, thing you're looking at. Um, we got moving very quickly and we we're fortunate to be able to work with some really great canvassers. Um, because of this being a unique moment, um, no matter how you cut it, um, we tried a couple of different things to see how they worked. Um, one, one piece that we had some skepticism with is uh, you know going around doing no contact canvassing and dropping uh, door hanger literature. We didn't know what kind of response rate we would get from people. Um, I think it's indicative about how excited people are about CV Fiber that we actually saw a pretty decent response rate. Um, I spent a lot of time out in Roxbury myself and I'd go home and look at the results the next day and the roads that I'd been on and we would see five, six, um, you know, half dozen, dozen people Turn coming off. down the next day. What'd you say, Jeremy? That wasn't me. That was somebody else that had, had piped up that wasn't muted. So no, go ahead, Nick. All right. Well, I had, I had a good time in Roxbury. Um, I don't want to present the uh, the illusion that we were able to hit every single door in the district. We spent the, the real initial time uh, calling people, but I'll dive into the numbers we got, and then I'm, I'm happy to take any, any questions or feedback or concerns. Um, this is a little bit fine print, David. Maybe we can circulate this afterwards. Um, this is at the start of the week. This is a breakdown of how we did community by community. Our goal internally was to get into the high two-digit response rate. Um, you can see some of the communities, the column in the right, we did much better than that. Some of it, there's a little bit work left to be done, and there's still results coming in. But that's why we looked at Roxbury, spent some time canvassing there. We're out canvassing in Duxbury right now. Um, I'm doing a turf in orange tomorrow, but we're trying to get enough responses from each community for it to be significant and useful to you. And, you know, we did that initially pushing hard on the phones, and that's where we focused our, uh, our lit dropping effort thus far, where we see there's gaps. Um, our team uh, can personally vouch for uh, 526 uh, surveys that we, we personally filled out with folks we talk with directly, either on the ground or over the phone. Um, and we've matched those to the initial list of 4,000 or so that was provided with us. Um, there's a total of 852 households that we identified, though, that have responded to the, uh, the survey within CV fiber territory. Uh, that delta of about 326 households, uh, some of them are very close to the routes that you're looking at, and we can dig a little deeper into that um, moving forward. Some of them are further afield, but it's valuable community da data that we collected that I think will be useful planning and for other purposes moving forward. Um, about 86 of the surveys were from completely outside of uh, your territory. And I think that shows the enthusiasm for the, the work you're doing and uh, the general excitement for broadband in Vermont. Um, we think those came in through front porch form or word of mouth or other uh, you know digital spreading around. And then uh, on top of that, we also collected about 910 new emails, um, which are for CV fibers now for future outreach, and about 2,000 plus phone numbers. Um, and then also collected valuable data on a whole host of folks uh, who are interested in pre-subscribing and other, other pieces of the project. So that's the work we've done thus far over, over the month. It's been a really exciting project for us. Um, it's an issue that I've worked on off and on for about 10 years now. and. Um, I spent a lot of time knocking on doors for various issues and talking to people on the phone. And this one is the most enthusiastic response I've, I've gotten. Um, people were genuinely happy to see me. Um, and I was trying not to make contact and scoot back out to my car. Uh, you know, I got a couple of people hollering out, uh, get CV fiber out here, we want, <laughs> we want fiber right away. 
And I want to reiterate that the fact that someone got a door hanger, took the time to fill out the survey, got a voicemail from one of us, took the time to call me back. Um, you don't see that in other uh, issue campaigns I've worked on. Um, and so that that's worth highlighting again. Great, so thanks. Fun. Thanks, <laughs> Nick and Connor. Time check, if anybody had any questions for the uh, phone bankers, I, I think we might have a couple of them on the line here. Um, so feel yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to add, if, if there's some anecdotal stuff from the Canva, you know, the, the people that did the phone bank that we ought to hear about, good and bad. I mean, I mean if, I, you guys probably had the whole range of responses, so I'd like to hear some of them. Well, they slanted towards the good, but um, don't take my word for it. Uh, Teddy, do you <laughs> wanna talk a little bit about your experience talking to folks? Yeah, sure, definitely. Um, really good response rates, um, generally speaking. Um, I've done a lot of phone banking work, and even though uh, people don't necessarily want to talk to you for a long time, everyone was super receptive when they found out I was calling for CV Fiber, and a lot of folks were very excited about the idea of getting fiber to them. Um, I talked to one woman, actually, whose husband runs a small business, but their Wi-Fi is too unreliable at their house. So he actually has to drive into town and use the library's Wi-Fi, which the library is closed, but the Wi-Fi is working. So he's driving into town, working in his car for a couple hours, driving back to charge his laptop. Um, and that wouldn't be necessary with CV Fiber system. So they were very excited to hear about that. Um, and folks were also just very, I heard a lot of stories <laughs> about a lot of, uh promises that have been made in the past to folks especially in like callis and marshfield area um that they were just like yes absolutely i'll sign up when can i sign up ready to go um so i had a very good response rate and a lot of really good conversations um yeah thanks and is ted on as well yep i'm here Oh, great. Did you want to weigh in, Ted? I see you now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, all that's definitely true. Um, definitely an overwhelmingly positive response, more so than almost any other phone banking I've done. Um, I would say, you know, anybody that picked up the phone um, and I told them, you know, what I was calling for, CV Fiber, um, they, you know, about 70% of people, um, you know, filled out the survey and were very enthusiastic, um, just, you know, from my experience. Um, one thing I did want to mention um, was there's a question on the survey that um, it's, uh, you know, how likely would you be to sign up for CV Fiber at $60 a month? And, you know, every like I said, everybody really did want to have the service, but uh, almost 60 to 70 percent of people that I spoke to mentioned that they would like it bundled with a landline. And I'm sure we all know uh, how spotty the cell coverage is in rural Vermont. Um, and uh, they mentioned that that might be a make or break. Um, so I made a notation of that. And uh, that was due for a couple of reasons. Like I said, the cell coverage, also cost. Um, you know, a lot of people have, they're signed up with Consolidated or uh, Verizon and it's cost efficient for them to have that bundle with the landline. Um, and then actually a couple of people uh, mentioned that they didn't want their kids to have cell phones. So that they still wanted to have a landline to be able to uh, contact their kids. Um, and then the other side of that was um, less so, but a good chunk of people uh, did say that they would be willing to get rid of their landline uh, and just move exclusively to Wi-Fi calling because the bandwidth would actually allow it um, if they had CV fiber. So um, I would say, you know, it was a significant amount of people mentioned um, this phone bundling and then uh, less significant, but a good chunk of people mentioned that they would be willing to get rid of their landline and move exclusively to Wi-Fi calling. That is very good information. Uh, Ray. Yeah, so um, one of the things that we have been concerned about is uh, how visible we are in the community. And I guess the question is, how often did you have to explain what CV Fiber was? Um, I would say um, most of the time, but I, if I got somebody on the phone, I would say maybe a quarter of the time they had heard of us. And uh, I would say most of them heard of CV Fiber through Front, front Porch Forum. Um, I actually, David Healy, I've heard your name mentioned quite a bit. Um, so you're doing a great job, I guess, getting the word out. 
Um, and uh, yeah, uh, it wasn't an insignificant amount of people that had already heard of C CV fiber. Okay. Ray, good. that is a number we can pull for you too. We did ask that that question in the survey. Oh, good. Not in the presentation, but I can follow up um, with more specifics. Anecdotally, I I actually was very surprised that people like knew right why I was there and what was it about was about and what was interesting too was the couple of conversations i had from across the driveway um people were like willing to go out they're like what do we have to do next let's fill out the survey but they were do we need to talk to our neighbors so i think there is you know these people are on the list we're going to be providing there's some enthusiasm for people to do some evangelizing and try to bring in other members of the community because they they sort of get it right you know if there's a critical mass of people on the road it's going to make more sense Right. from a business standpoint so i really see the work we did is we've you know there's some really strong leads here that um you or us or others will have a chance to double down on and um you know when, when you're able to anchor some of these routes there's people excited to help um find other pre subscribers which i think makes a, a great deal of difference to what you're trying to do it, it also sounds like it uh, reinforces our continuing use of front porch forum as a mechanism to get the word out yeah, no, I mean, I think the fact that people are responding to a survey that's left on their door or left on their answering machine, it shows enthusiasm for the product, but also, you know, some some recognition. Um, I'm a big believer in repetitive touches when you're trying to reach people. And there's a point where they're never here to view, and then there's a point where you seem completely ubiquitous. And I think we're sort of at that tipping point with uh, some of these communities. Well, certainly one touch is not a campaign. No. <laughs> All right, any other questions for the last mile, folks? Siobhan? Mute, unmute, there it is. <laughs> I'm really interested in knowing what what the response has been from the orange folks, because a lot of the people that I've spoken to, like some were very excited, but a lot of them were like wary, ver verging on suspicious. And I was wondering if if uh, you had much of a sense of that from the few that you've spoken to already. Um, I don't, and Ted or Teddy, if you've had a specific conversation, um, I am actually going to planning on being out over the next two days in Orange, on the doors, wrapping up um, some turf there. Um, so I'd be happy to reconnect later in the week. Um, but I don't, I don't have a specific Orange. Uh, story yet that i can think of okay but not a negative um, one just yeah i can i can say it was uh you know mostly positive uh to my recollection there were actually a few folks from orange that didn't have internet didn't want internet so that's and and i you know i guess you'll find that across rural vermont it's not so abnormal so well orange isn't is an older community um there mm -hmm. there are some younger folks moving in but we're an aging community and i'm hoping getting internet in we'll get some more younger people coming in absolutely okay. any other questions henry um yeah i i missed the first couple of minutes because i was finishing up some analysis of the preliminary results from the survey so i um i don't know how um the what stage we are in this process are we um you know st still going strong with continuing um with the towns um uh, and and canvassing because um from my results which i emailed to all the delegates um so you can check your email i could also put it on the screen um there's you know a couple towns that didn't get anything uh that there is a, a a, a broad difference in the um, response rates uh, compared to the eligible um, premises. And um, I, I just was wondering if that was addressed before I came on. I'll try to address it really quick, Henry, and I'm happy to connect with you directly. And we also have a slide deck that we can send around. Um, our goal was to get into the high two digits, at least with each community. And we shared a breakdown. There were some communities we hit it. There's some communities where results are still coming in. And there's some com communities where there's a slight gap. Duxbury happens to be one of the ones that we prioritized. 
wrapping up. We've had folks out on doors in Duxbury yesterday, today, and we will have over the next two days. So everybody gets a pamphlet. Um, we saw some survey results come in last night. It looks like from Duxbury, I think part of that was your work, Henry, probably sharing on a front porch forum. Uh, Dave was also out there knocking on doors. Um, other communities, we saw much, much higher uh, response rates than we were, we were expecting, um, you know, 50, 60, 70%. Um, so there was a difference. What we've tried to do is shift our efforts. Uh, so we're looking at a statistically significant sample from each community. We had a list of about 4,000 folks we started with. We were able to match those with 3,000 people who we had phone data for. We've been calling them throughout uh, across the whole territory, so not um, town by town. And then the follow-up door-to-door work, which is extra challenging during COVID, um, but has been proving somewhat fruitful, um, has been more, more targeted. Um, so that's my very quick recap of where we're at so far. And there's some hard numbers we can send over as well. We did hit uh, 65 doors in Duxbury today. So that is one of the ones we're wrapping up. That's good. Yeah, yeah, keep me posted on that. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, I mean, uh, in terms of the the distribution, I don't know if I, uh, if I can share this table with you guys no david go ahead henry is seven it uh, later on the later on the agenda is survey results six oh, okay. very good all right thank you very much all right anything else for the last mile folks i just want to say thank you <laughs> thanks very thank much you. it's been a pleasure yeah, working on this process thank you all right thank you thanks everybody uh definitely appreciate your work um all right let's move on to the next agenda item uh clerk report jeremy you had something for us yeah so uh the name of the organization has officially been changed to cv fiber with both the uh secretary of state's office and with the vermont state archives and records administration uh, that's the sara um the one little uh hiccup uh, is regarding our CV fiber DBA. Uh, we had to cancel that because uh, Vermont statutes prohibit registering a DBA with the same name as the organization itself, which isn't really a big deal. Um, we do still have our Central Vermont Internet CUV DBA, and that is now registered um, with CV fiber as the owning organization. Um, the other thing that I looked into was registering our logo. And according to the person I was speaking with at the Secretary of State's office, they require that trademarks be exclusively used to identify goods um, rather than services. Uh, service marks are for services, trademarks are for goods. Um, they also said that service marks are not registrable at the state level. So therefore, unless we produce a good that our logo can be associated with, we can't uh, register it at the state level. And I guess my question is, do we want to, or do we either, or will we be producing a good that the state would recognize as such? Um, or should we abandon registration of the logo that we had said we would do in a previous meeting? Well, I, I think I can take that. I think I'd probably speak for most folks. Um, aside from Chuck's suggestion that we that we market raise CV fiber mugs, um, I think no, <laughs> we're, we're we're not ever going to produce anything. That's not really what, what we're built for. Um, if my camera worked, I'd sh I'd show you the one that I have. But uh, um, if we wanted to go for a service mark at the national level, I suppose we could. I'm not sure that the the juice is worth the squeeze on that one, but I'd be happy to uh, happy to hear from folks otherwise if there's a compelling reason. Chuck, we've got bigger fish to fry. Let's stay focused. All right. Okay. Anything else, Jeremy, on uh, clerk report? Uh, nope, just that uh, canceling the DBA costs 20 bucks, and that's in the invoice that I sent over to uh, Jeremy Hansen. Um, and the receipt for that is included with my uh, with my invoice. So, and everybody should have a copy of that by this point. Um, <coughs> any questions for Jeremy or anything else about the uh, 
naming or, or trademarks, service marks, etc. Okay, moving along. Um, reassembling the finance committee. So I had a I had a chance to talk to um, Jerry Diamantides as he was spearheading the uh, conversations with folks to do audits and getting somebody to do our books. Um, Jerry, do you want to do you want to spearhead um, the thinking here behind the reassembling the finance committee? Oh, sure. Um, and 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 it I guess in part it also goes with the uh, the next item on the uh, on the agenda. Um, so as far as the the you know the finance committee has the the treasurer that we have currently hasn't been able for, for personal reasons to fulfill the role. And also the uh, the finance committee, uh, you know, some of, the, some of the folks that are on the finance committee have really been pulled away because of COVID and, and haven't been able to, to work on a regular basis on the finance committee. So uh, on, the, on the one hand, I'm putting my name in the hat to be treasurer if, if the board so uh, desires that. And then I think we, we need to reassemble the finance committee so that we, we can develop a charter for the finance committee and move forward with the, the fundraising and the, the uh, grant writing that needs to be done ASAP. Um, and you know these, these things have kind of by default fall into the business development committee, which is going to come up later for with a uh, uh, a discussion about their their charter perhaps and and the committee's report. But what what I what I'm seeing is is that we we really need to pull some of the activity that's been laid on the business development committee, um, especially with regard to grant writing, bring that over to the finance committee and. With the money that we now have coming in and going out, and, and certainly there will be a lot more in a very short amount of time, um, we need to keep really tight track of that. So, uh, as I said, these two these two uh, items on the two items on the agenda are, are kind of aligned. So, I've I've talked to bookkeepers and I've talked to auditors. We've identified a bookkeeper that we would like to work with. Um, She's already made contact with Jeremy, and I, I, I believe that uh, Jeremy is personally comfortable with her, it seems, from the, the emails that I've seen going back and forth. I, I've talked to auditors that have tried to talk me out of having an audit and even stating you know, to us that the, uh, the VITA loan, even though it says it requires an audit, we're in a position where that may not necessarily be the case uh, because we're so... Uh, such novices so young at this. Uh, we don't have that much of a track record that really needs to be audited, but that's not gonna last very long. Uh, so that, that, may, that may change in the very near future. Uh, but I think what we, what we really would like to see, what I would like to see is the finance committee come up to the level of activity that the business development committee has had and that we can work together between the finance committee and the business development committee to have our budgets aligned, our strategic plans aligned, our annual, our annual forecasted expenditures and receipts aligned, so that we can uh, we can be able to res respectfully handle all the money that is going to be coming through our coffers shortly. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's my 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 uh, my bit there, but I'm happy to take questions. Yes, I, yes. I, I, I think that the punchline here is that um, we need to reform this committee. I mean, there's folks that the last time we did the appointments, we appointed folks who are no longer even part of CV Fiber. So um, I am interested in serving on this. Jerry, as our future treasurer, hopefully will be. Be nice if we had three more people that would be willing to um, be a part of kind of monitoring the uh, the finances and sort of the money side of things. I see I see Ray's hand up. Anybody else willing, interested? I see Siobhan. I need one more. And Jeremy, thank you very much. We could certainly, if there's still another person who I can't see hands up for or whatever, please uh, 
shout out or um, note it in the chat. We can we can obviously add people later if we'd like to. But that way we don't run into the problem of having a two person quorum. Chuck, are you are you volunteering or are you? Uh, no, I have a, a question slash comment. Um, sure. Okay, so uh, uh, first the comment, um, since we are indexing with a higher than average number of members of the public here, I would like to call out that committees uh, can sometimes have members of the public as well. You don't have to be a delegate or alternate to, to, to serve. Um, and then my question is, uh, Jared, would Jerry have to step down to be treasurer? He would indeed, yes. Okay. He would not be able to be the alternate for Berlin anymore. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts about this, Ray? So it, um, it sounds like there's multiple actions here. One is that uh, we want to retain the bookkeeper. I think there's a lot of positive um, uh, energy here that people are happy with that. And so we need to, uh, is a vote required for that? And second, um, uh, since, since Jerry has now resigned as the alternate from Berlin, um, we need a vote perhaps for uh, appointing him as treasurer, and I'm all in favor of doing that. And then the third thing is to send the folks who volunteered, I guess, to go out and come up with their charter and come back to the, uh, come back to the board. Right, and so if you take a look at the agenda, for example, that's I have all of those items as agenda items, so I'd like to take them one by one if we could. So for right now, though, what I'd like to do is constitute the finance committee so that we have the committee and that we can we can take some time, meet with each other, and do exactly as you said, Ray. So unless anybody has any motion? any objections, I would move that we're going to appoint a Jerry Diamantides. Jeremy Hansen, Ray Pelletier, Siobhan Perricone, and uh, Jeremy Matt as members of the CV Fiber Finance Committee. Second. Okay. Siobhan is honest. Point of order. Uh, and that would be that uh, the treasurer um, is might be an ex officio member, but they're not a member, per se. Yes, they're an ex officio member, according to the rules. So sure but we're constituting our own finance committee right now and i would expect the treasurer to have a vote in this committee um, i don't think we're prohibited by statute from offering people who are not on the governing board votes on the committee that's correct the point is that the, it would be the finance committee that's overseeing overseeing the work of the treasurer Okay, I mean, I'm I'm fine with the motion as it is right now. I think if the finance committee wants to figure out how people want to vote, whether they want to let the treasurer vote or not, I think we can sort that out later. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, or requests for roll call? <clears throat> Motion passes unanimously. Moving to the next agenda item, we have an appointment of a tre the treasurer and bookkeeper. Um, I would like to move to appoint uh, Jerry Diamantides as CV Fiber treasurer and therefore rescinding his, uh, his appointment as a governing board alternate. Second. Okay, I think that was Chuck's second. I heard that right. That's what I heard too. Okay, any any further discussion? Okay, please signify uh, approval by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions or roll call requests? All right, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Jerry. You are now our new treasurer. Hopefully we will be able to hold on to you. We'll try. I, I'll let the select board know tomorrow about the uh, change in circumstances here. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Jerry. Um, so the next step would be um, to appoint Shannon Blaze, and I'm going to write this in the, I'm gonna write her name down for spelling B-L-A-I-S. And Jerry, would you like to explain the uh, kind of the, the circumstances? We have not signed a contract yet. We do not have an agreement yet. She has explained um, what she's going to do and not going to do and rates and whatnot. Jerry, would you 
give us a refresher? Yeah, sure. Uh, she is a bookkeeper. She's not a CPA. She doesn't do audits and she doesn't do taxes. Okay. Um, but what she does do is she is a bookkeeper who, who has worked with nonprofits in the past and she charges $50 an hour. She's expecting to do just a few hours a month with us. It, it's not a heavy lift for her. Um, she uses uh, QuickBooks. She does not use QuickBooks online. She says that that's, that subscription really isn't worth it. Once you buy QuickBooks and you have it, it's just a matter of sending files around. It's easy to manage. Um, and I can I can I can see how that would work. Um, so my plan is to um, have her fulfill those bookkeeping functions under my oversight, and have her be the um, day to day. Of course, it's not day to day, but to have have her be the the, the regular conduit for keeping the books, with me uh, looking over her shoulder if you will, um, and I, I see the treasurer's role as maintaining con contact and oversight with the bookkeeper and with the treasurer not being the bookkeeper, uh, allowing the treasurer to do more of the planning and budgeting and, and forecasting of money coming and going so that we can look forward um, and not be looking straight down at our feet as we're walking along. So I, I think it's a very good idea to, to get her on, and she's she doesn't require a contract. The long term, you know, it's it's kind of month to month. Um, we'll get used to each other, and and we'll work together. And if it doesn't work, we can find someone else. Um, that's certainly not a problem. So any any thought any thoughts or questions about um, hiring contracting with with Shannon Blaze to do bookkeeping for us? Hey, is that a finger up? I can't really tell. Yeah, it is a finger up. Okay. So um, my question has to do with my ex expectation is that anybody walking into this job is going to have a, a, a ramp up uh, and gathering gathering information and, and filling the books, right? And so the, we're going to see some uh, initial uh, expenses, and that's fine. Uh, that's, that's expected. Uh, the other bit is, however, with not having a contract is that uh, we own the data. And even though it's her her books, her QuickBooks or whatever, I want to make sure that we get the data. And that's one of the reasons why you'd have a contract, for example, as two pages that it might be. But, oh, very uh, good, Ray. I, I, I agree with you. We my, my my intention is to have a probably a weekly data share with her, and we, we you know make it a make it a standard like every Friday afternoon or every Monday morning, wh whatever it is. That you know we're we're uploaded so that we're fully uh, at the same place with with whatever her QuickBooks is. But I'm I'm more than happy as we develop this and move forward to you know to take uh, others' expertise. Frank, would you mute yourself, please? Okay, I, I just muted Frank. If Frank, yeah. if you want to talk again, put a message in the chat and I will unmute you. <laughs> I guess the other bit was um, confidentiality. Uh, we would anticipate, you know, we would only make information public that we want to make public and that uh, she would refrain from doing anything uh, without authorization from the treasurer or from the board or the, or the finance committee. Yeah, so so I'm I, I agree with you, Ray. I, I I don't think that the contract needs to be complicated, but I do think that there are some elements for uh, protecting our interests, including confidentiality and such. Um, it doesn't have to be like any sort of binding contract where she must perform, you know, for a year or anything like that. But no, I'm 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 on board with you. You know, however we decide to move forward, we will have some clarity about what it is that she's doing for us. And what our expectations of her are. Okay. I'll take that. I'll take that on and send a draft out. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Michael. Uh, actually, you know, what? I saw RD's hand up first. RD, then Michael. 
Thank you. Um, it, it, it's, uh, we should have a corresponding copy of QuickBooks um, so that if anything goes amiss with our bookkeeper, we have a copy of the books. Um, and it's also um, my experience that was useful for the bookkeeper to have a dedicated laptop for, uh, to work on. Uh, once again, in case anything goes amiss, that laptop is available to us. Third, um, any firm that we might contract with for auditing services um, should be uh, should meet with our treasurer and our bookkeeper. Um, uh, my experience has been that um, uh, that different auditors, different CPAs, make a different use of QuickBooks and QuickBooks features. Um, and um, it uh, was um, my last experience was rather tedious, having to change my, my book practices to conform with those of the auditor. My, so those are, are three points that um, I'd like to make with respect to making sure that these files, these, these uh, QuickBook files are redundant. That seems fair. Um... I don't know that, I mean, personally, I'm not sure that we need to go so far as to have a dedicated laptop for this. I would prefer that we not invest CV fiber funds in something like that just yet. But um, I think it, there is some wisdom if we can read these files using the online or other um, version of QuickBooks on our own, I think that is a, that is a, a wise step. So maybe, you know, J Jerry and I, or the, you know, the rest of the finance committee can talk about what that looks like and what's, what's the next, What's the prudent next step then to um, making sure that we have that redundancy and that we don't um, we don't lose anything? That would be yeah, that would be catastrophic. I was just admonishing my students earlier this morning about the importance of redundancy and backups. Well, Jeremy, I, I've been working from home for since AOL dial-up days. It's got to be pushing <laughs> 25 years, and I have uh, three different hard drives with information on them and I'm I'm you know I'm I'm uh crazy enough about this kind of stuff that sometimes when I leave the house I bring one with me you know um so it it's it's uh yeah I I I fully get that RD I think that's really important um we can't we can't lose anything uh, I concur and of course, we also have the we have the the Google Drive now, uh, where we're going to be uploading things for everybody to see. So yeah, that's um, yeah. music to my uh, ears, Jerry. If, if I, if I may. Mm -hmm. one one follow up point uh, is that we may need to re our bookkeeper may need to rebuild our financial history um, into uh, into quick. Books. Yes, sir. A, That's expected. We may need to account for our financial history from day one, whenever that was. <laughs> I yes, hope we do. <laughs> that's almost almost certainly true, and yeah, that's uh, thankfully though we can still count on. I mean, I I think we've gone through maybe one checkbook in our in our whole existence. So we're talking about twenty five, thirty outbound checks, and I can probably count on two hands the number of inbound checks that we've had so aside from a small donations on the online platform so pretty uh, should be pretty straightforward I'm hoping uh, I got Michael and then Chuck so um, it was um, perfect uh, RD Jerry and Jeremy all went where I was about to go um, so I'll just um, give it a slight variation on that um, uh, Quick, QuickBooks, the desktop version of QuickBooks is superior to QuickBooks Online, but QuickBooks Online is very valuable for an organization like us because of the way we can share with it. Um, Jerry wouldn't have to have his weekly Monday morning or Friday afternoon visit if there's a QuickBooks Online account that he can just glance at. Um, so, um, I agree with all the points that just got made. That's I, I won't reiterate them because you covered them. But that is the point. We we need some um, access 
for other people and redundancy and ability to carry the data away if if something goes wrong. And um, I guess I agree with Jeremy. I don't think we need the laptop yet, but everything else that was stated, I think, makes sense. Thanks, Michael. Chuck? I was just going to make a comparable plug for QuickBooks Online solving those use cases perfectly. So we, we should consider it. All right. I hear I hear marching orders for the Finance Committee. Any, anything else um, before we... Um, so let's see, secretary, clerk, person, did I, did we already make a motion to appoint the bookkeeper? I feel. No. Okay. So Let's I'm going to move. In the discussion. Great. I move that we appoint um, Shannon Blaze to be the bookkeeper for CV Fiber uh, at a rate not to exceed $50 an hour. Second. Okay. Seconded by Second. Siobhan. I heard. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed abstentions or roll call requests? Motion passes unanimously. We have a treasurer and a bookkeeper. Thanks, everybody. Mo moving along. Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission support and the uh, PM search. David, you want to take this? Sure. So we were hoping to come to the meeting tonight. The Business Development Committee was working on a PM development and at the same time, trying to reach out to the Regional Planning Commission to see what functions they would could help us with. And I don't know how many people on the board were over. This came to my mind only because when I go to the Vicuda meetings, it seems to me there's a lot of regional planning people on those meetings supporting the CUDs. So what I did last week was I reached out to Bonnie, uh, I've forgotten her last name at the moment. Weninger. Um, and I also reached out to the three RPCs who were supporting other CUDs and got their contracts. And so I sent Bonnie a list of things, support areas that I saw the other groups were doing. And they, the administrative support type things, are, and these are all subject to our, you know, approval and not approval. Take minutes at all board meetings and committees. We already have somebody that does that, but some RPCs do that. Post materials on website, agendas, minutes, policies, RFPs. Some RPCs do that for CUDs. Maintain all the documents, papers, and policies. Um, and then do responsible for communication with board members, agendas, minutes, and meeting materials. That was one. They're also available to be treasurer if we wanted them to be treasurer. They are very adept at doing grant writing and for both grants and loans and said they were willing to support us in those activities. And then in terms of contracting support, RFP drafting, negotiations, drafting, and management, they're more than capable of doing that because they do a lot of it in-house already. And then in technical assistance, doing research, planning, policies, governance, structure, are all areas that are topics that they could consider. So I sent that list to her Friday of last week. I only I called her today because I hadn't heard from her, and she said she was trying to get some some more information before she replied to us. But she said she'd have a, a proposal to us for the services they could offer and some estimates of what it would cost. And um, so, from that standpoint, I mean, we'll, we'll you know the business development committee will have to you know reconsider this when we meet again, and we'll bring it back to the board. But I just want to give an update. It was. A pretty positive development from my perspective because it's it's sort of more organized and in one place. But um, I'll leave you know questions for that right now. Um, whether it's worth continuing to pursue or not, uh, good idea, bad idea. I think a lot of people on the business development committee thought it was a good idea. Henry. Uh, yeah, just one question. I wasn't sure from that description you gave whether project management was included in their capabilities? If, we, if we're talking about another thing to be developed, I mean, project management has got two things. There's administrative assistance and there's project management. And until we have a real project, and, we, and we're working on that. I mean, Siobhan and, and, and um, Ray have been working on that. 
I've got a call out to Carol Monroe to see what kind of definition we need for that kind of a position to over super, you know, to oversee our piece of that kind of work. So I'll be coming back to the board to the business development and the board. So what you're saying is that um, we need someone else for the network project management um, that uh, because they don't provide those services. Which makes I mean, sense. they could, but that, it's certainly not something they, you know, that, that I don't know. We could pursue it, but don't know. Okay. But yeah, so so as I think because the Regional Planning Commission will offer some of these administrative services, these were some of the things that we were asking, um, you know, our previous project manager to do. Right. When I think what we're talking about here is let's get the administrative stuff. If the Regional Planning Commission is willing and able to do it, um, there's going to be some nice continuity and some built-in um, capability there already. Um, the Regional Planning Commission is not going to go away. Their mission lines up pretty nicely with our mission. Um, they know what we're about. We know what they're about. Um, and then when we get a project manager, that project manager can focus on the project. Yeah. The other thing that they, they have multiple staff that can do different functions. So we're not paying top dollar for something that's a more of a clerical function. And then we're paying a higher price for that. And she, so it's the proposal she's going to give us this week will have the billing rates for their staff, which are basically at her cost. The billing rate is their wage plus their overhead plus um, expenses, which they don't have. So don't have very money. So we'll get that to the committee soon and hopefully come back to the board. All right. Any other? Oh, Michael. Um, just, uh, uh, information question, um, how, how, um, the CB fiber towns and central Vermont regional planning commission towns overlap, um, which towns are not covered, which towns do they have that we don't have? And does it matter at all? It may not, but I'm just curious yeah. about it. Yeah. The only town that they don't have is Elmore. They have Washington and Orange, and they have all the way to Duxbury. The only towns that they have that we don't have are the Waitsfield Valley, the Warren Valley, based in Warren and Waitsfield. Yeah. So it's it's a pretty convenient overlap. I I, I remember yeah. you know so this like organic growth of our district. I remember being in their office and looking at their map, and I was like, that's it. It looks pretty pretty much the same as our map. The other, the other thing is an advantage for me, I mean, you know, not that I'm going to be here forever, but all the GIS data that I've developed for us, they can handle. <laughs> they have a, they have a two person GIS shop. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments, Siobhan? So I need, I, I've gotten feedback from people on the, because I had thought the previous announcement that we had sent out for the PM search was good, but apparently it's not. So I've gotten some feedback from people about repairing it. And what I don't know is how this impacts that, because I'm not clear on what is an administrative function versus a project manager function. And so I'm hoping that, I'm pretty sure Ray is happy to work with me on that. I've gotten feedback from Ken, I haven't finished yet. I, you know, I've gotten feedback from a lot of people to, to look at. Um, but I was kind of holding off because I wasn't sure if the Regional Planning Commission was gonna be handling project management stuff or if we were still gonna be hiring a, a project manager. And it sounds like we are still going to be hiring a project manager, just hopefully with a more narrow focus on what they're doing so we can pay them for fewer hours is the goal. Is that, am I understanding that right? I, I mean, that's, that, that's my understanding. Okay. When it, when it's, when it's necessary. Yeah. Until. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because there isn't exactly a project right now. I mean, we're on the, we're on the cusp of it. But when there is a project, then yeah, we want the project manager to run that. But okay, thanks. So, so I, I so I think when when David gets back the proposal from um, regional planning, uh, we should be able to essentially take any of those items that were in the the job description 
that we're going to be willing to hand off to regional planning and uh, strike those from the ad. Okay, any other thoughts or questions about support from regional planning or the ongoing process of searching for our next project manager? Okay. Uh, survey results. Do you have so, anything? Do you want to share your yeah. screen? Anybody? So what I, I asked, um, I gave a copy of the complete survey file to Henry and Henry, I guess tonight finished doing some analysis of it. And he said he could do a quick overview of some of the results. Is that okay, Henry? Sure. Yeah. You um, want to share a screen? Yeah. Yep, I just, gonna... just made you presenter. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you see this? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so and this is the list of uh, CV fiber towns. Um, the um, the um, data from uh, Vermont Public Service Department broadband status numbers for each of those towns survey responses by each of these towns and then a percentage over here there's two towns elmore and um these towns didn't have any survey results elmore and barry city i don't know if we're trying to get barry city or not and these towns also showed up um, <laughs> which are in ncv fiber territory all the way to St. Jay. So um, that's kind of a quick look. Now, my results were as of December 30th, so they're not as up to date. Um, but we see that, you know, in these first five towns here, um, you know, Worcester, Plainfield, Callis, Middlesex, Cabot, and uh, Roxbury, they're all close to 10%. And then the rest of these are, you know, very small percentages. Um, so I, uh, I would like to jump in with a clarification, Henry, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, yes, because I don't know what the scope was for the canvassing. So that was gonna yeah, be- Yeah, the, the canvassing was not town-wide. Um, there were a limited number of addresses in each town provided to the canvassing teams. Um, and so it, it's important to know that. So for example, in Moortown, I think the canvassers were provided with 58 addresses, if I recall. So the fact that we got 57 means we got nearly 100% of the canvassed, um, or, or at least a rate of, of near 100%. But that said, there could have been people who were not part of the that address who still also responded to the survey, because I also did a couple from porch forums. So I, I can't tell you what the overlap of that 57 is, with the actual addresses that will provide the canvasser um, to the canvassers. So I just wanted to clarify that because you know if you're looking at these response rates and and you know they they look low, it may be that the number of addresses supplied to canvassers in a particular region was also low. So yeah, um, who provided the addresses to the canvassers? We did. Okay. Um, and where did that list come from if it must have been some subset of the eligible premises or um no it was a uh all the premises are in 500 feet of the road center line of the route that they did that oh that okay, okay okay so okay i just selected all the premises and Excellent. then the summary table well i don't know how much time we want to spend on this tonight but the table we prepared with every route tells you how many fall into which category of service in terms of no service, four to one, under 25, that kind of thing. So, so Henry, do you have any aggregate summary information by question? Uh, no, I haven't gotten that okay. far yet. So no. what I did, I did some of this. Okay. And the question about, have you heard about CV fiber? 65% of people said yes, 35% said no. Do you have internet service? 94% said yes, 6% said no. Has it met your needs? 16% said yes. 38% said no, 42% said not always. Do you have internet phone service, VOIP? 26% said yes, 73% said no. 
how many um what was the average number of persons using uh, students were using online per household was 1.8 so that's pretty high number of class hours learning about five hours average was the number i could it was really hard to pull it out of the data that i had how many members of your household work remotely three quarters of the people who responded to this question said yes about 1.9 people work from home uh estimated number of hours working from home i didn't get to finish that one um how many members you also use the internet for entertainment 100 percent. how many hours a day 6.4 <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many people are working and how many people are doing entertainment. But anyway, that was with everybody in the household, so it's easy to get that number. Um, are you aware of various broadband programs for subsidies for low-income households? Only 22% of our survey respondents knew that there were even programs to subsidize broadband. So that was one of the things the Department of Public Service was interested in. Um, uh, are you various? Got that. If CV5 were brought competitively priced broadband services, this is approximately $60 and up per month. 48% said they definitely would subscribe, 30% they said they would probably subscribe, 12% said maybe, and the rest, seven, 8% said probably not or not. Um, would you be willing to invest in helping finance the construction and operation of the network for the first 24 months? 15% said loan, 11% said gift, 42% said pre-subscription, and 19% said volunteer. So that's a lot of volunteers out there that we haven't tapped into. And may we contact you? 81% of the respondents said, yes, we could. So we have those emails now. And in terms of all the questions we wanna do follow up at some point, I think this survey has a lot of data we can mine to um, get ourselves going. Anyway, so that's, that. as of January 1st, I guess, is the data that I had. Henry asked the other question of, do we want people to continue to fill in the survey? And my question, my, my suggestion is yes. Uh, there's no harm. And because I have the survey, what, the way the survey is compiled, the date is automatically entered into the result, into the record. So we can actually parse out who, who was done before January 1st and who was done after January 1st. So I'd suggest running another, you know, if you've already done Front Porch Forum in the last two or three weeks, maybe wait another week. If you haven't done it in a while, put something in front porch forum i i have to tell you i get people even with putting it in front porch forum and i'm pretty consistent with this um they, you know they don't i'm not getting a lot of feedback and so I, it's uh it'd be interesting to see what other people are doing on that regard um and you know i think i'll leave the survey section done for now because i know the time is tight all right, uh, Jeremy, then Henry. So uh, a quick question. Are there leftover trifolds and door hangers from the literature drops? Because what I'm wondering is if it might be worth saying like, hey, Plainfield Hardware, can I leave a dozen of these at the counter or something like that? You know, I, I know enough of the I know a few of the business owners in town who might be willing to do that. Um, I'll get, I'll get that last mile. Already around. Yeah, Les Mile has it all. I'll have them give it back to us and give distribute it to everybody. And if you think that's a good idea, maybe we should get some more of the trifolds printed up. So we have we have some left, just to confirm. Oh, that. Nick's still here. <laughs> I'm still here. But not, <laughs> how many do we have left? Uh, more than a couple what dozen. Okay, so, right. know, we, okay. We have quite we have quite a few, um, but Good. a bunch less than we started with. Super. Enough All for right. the hard work. Great. Right. Thanks for that, Nick. So, uh, so hold on a second though. But Jeremy, you also had another question, which I thought you were asking. Um, did the addresses that we um, that we asked last mile to to survey do they include the updated routes in Washington and Duxbury? I'll take Chuck it. Or David. I, think, I think I think so. There was a robust selection of uh, uh, addresses so, in Duxbury. Fewer than Duxbury, fewer. Than Duxbury Washington. had every address in town um, because I didn't have a route at the time, and then I Washington, I did not have a route. Okay, so that so we kind of we took a bigger a bigger bite of those towns then. Okay, so I have um, Henry, and then um, and I see there's a question from Alan in the chat that we'll we'll get to. Henry? 
Yeah, I'm just curious, um, you know, when you were talking about leaving them at the hardware store, uh, similarly, you know, finding out um, who did reply and, and me going around door to door to the people that didn't reply. So a similar kind of, because I think, you know, I think we've saturated next door and front porch forum and it's really time to get you know delegate boots on the ground um uh, so to speak so i agree um so alan gilbert had a question in the chat i will um, verbalize this uh, is it fair to describe the purpose of this survey as gauging interests of people living along the routes in Isle suggested as initial build out whether they would subscribe to a fiber service i think the purpose has been a bit confusing David or Chuck, you want to weigh in? I, I mean, I, I think that's an accurate description. Yeah, I don't know what part, Alan, I'd like to know what part is confusing. I, I thought we, I thought the survey was another general survey of all 20 towns no. to try to figure out where there was the most interest. No, I, my original goal was to, we have these six routes. Let's find out how many people on the routes are really interested in, in participating and subscribing. So that's why the addresses are limited to those routes that I gave um, last mile. Now, it, people can disagree with that, but that's where it's that's what the original intent was. So that so that makes the collection of information from surveys people took on their own initiative online that muddies the water a bit is that is that correct well we have i mean we can match addresses we can match the addresses from the roots to the addresses that are not on the roots that are in the survey so yeah no i think you you i think we can sort it out and find out who's who's in who's in the route and who's not in the route that took the survey i guess i'm just trying to figure out exactly what this tells us that's all i'm 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 i'm, I'm a little bit clearer i think i'm getting a clearer picture but it's been a bit confusing at least for me basically who you know I, I was mostly interested in who do we have enough people to subscribe on a road um and i don't know if we have enough information to do that or not and um you know it's it's getting towards the hour i mean not the the uh in, what's the name inter Isles feasibility study picked these routes because of the density the lack of cable service and the paucity of um, service to begin with. So that's how the the uh, the six routes were originally chosen. Not, and now we have eight routes. Um, and so you know whether this is going to be useful information or not. Then we have the the coos stuff that's trying to figure out and digest, which I know Chuck will talk about in a little bit, but. Um, that's sort of where so, I'm at with the survey. So if I could just have one follow-up question. I'm trying to figure out what the high number, response number for Worcester really means. And I'm not quite sure I understand what it is, what the meaning is. Well, when you see the numbers broken out for Worcester, you'll know what they answered to the question. I mean, there's, you know, the eight, ten, 10 questions, you know, were they going to subscribe or not? Yes or no? You know, it's... Well, I, I, I think I can take a crack at this too. So as we're filing, you know, our loan request with Vita, and as we're going into the project, mm -hmm. you know, we have the numbers of the cash flow that were that we had Fred whip up for us last year. But there were assumptions about take rates in there, and if we say we're going to build the black route, well, what what does that mean? Do we have any concrete data that actually tells us what the probability that we're going to get forty or fifty or sixty percent? And if there's you know, 60% of people are saying, yes, we definitely will take it along this specific route. David can pull that out for that particular route, and then we can include that conclusion and that the fact that we went that extra step to say, these people, we're really confident that we're going to hit 40%, and that's our assumption, rather than just guessing. And if there's a number, if 
you know, for people who say, you know, the $60 a month, we have a price point, we have some, some sense of the price elasticity, you know, that the tolerance for um, a, a higher price or lower price, we don't necessarily know that, but we at least know that single price point. So this is, I think this is a quiver, or this is an arrow in our quiver as we're going towards um, getting the funds to actually build out, to build out the project. I don't know if that helps at all. Alan. Well, I I haven't seen the survey results, so I don't know if 100% of the people in Worcester who responded to the survey said yes, we will take we will subscribe uh, to fiber optic service from CV Fiber. It could be 100% said no, we don't we don't want it. So Alan, not... I'll, send, I'll send you the spreadsheet for Worcester. Okay, that would be helpful. That really would. Thank you. I'll send it to everybody. I'll send it every town to everybody. Okay, sounds because good, thanks for that. What I'll do with that, I'll send the survey results and I'll send the list of addresses that we were supposed to get results from. So you have a comparison and if you wanna contact your neighbor, you'll know who didn't fill it in that you like, see, I think they ought to fill it in. Yep, thank you. All right, All right. so I've got uh, Jeremy, then Ray, then Henry posted a question in chat. So, so let's start with Jeremy. Um, so I guess my question is, if this is to gauge interest along routes and to select the next route, why are we paying coups and what are we getting from coups that we aren't getting from the survey? <laughs> Chuck, do you want to take that? Okay. <laughs> sure, the, right, right now, the answer to that question is nothing. Um, that said, okay. uh, coups, coups will allow us potentially to provide a little more structure to uh, things like subscription presales. Um, so, you know, if, if you can imagine we're the next step along this endeavor, we've actually selected where we're going to build first. Um, we can start to contact those people uh, along that first build out route, route and say, we are estimating we are going to be at your address with service by say June, 2021, just to throw an incredibly aggressive date out there. Um, and so uh, what Coos would allow us to do is uh, uh, actually get them to pick like a service plan offering to see what the service plan offerings are um, and to pre-subscribe uh, and ultimately uh, actually purchase. So Coos um, does handle uh, the actual um, subscription management is my understanding uh, and, and allows us to, to um, manage that piece of it. Um, that said, uh, we're still at the very early phases of trying to set Coos up and it is a bit of a struggle. It's it's not the uh, easiest software ever to figure out. And um, and uh, I've probably read the manual three times over at this point. Uh, and so, uh, you know, whether Coos is going to ultimately work out for us, I can't answer at this point in time. We've run into roadblocks that have been incredibly frustrating along the way um, that, that have made, at least me and, and I think David as well, Kind of scratch our heads and say is this really the tool we want to be using regardless of whether it it is solving a problem for us right now or not um and uh, i i can't really answer that question just yet uh, it may still prove uh to provide value but we preempted it by sending the survey out we uh limited ourselves from getting some of the value out of it that it does try to offer uh and um it is worth noting that we were getting a lot more robust data as a result of it because their survey capabilities doesn't allow you to add much in the way of custom questions. So, you know, our data set is actually going to be far more robust as a result of having done it ourselves than, than leveraging Coots. So I, I, I want to follow up on, on that a little bit, Chuck, and Michael, I'm going to add you to the, uh, to the queue here. Um, so I had already offered this to David, Chuck, if, if there's, if there's a matter of, um, mangling data or writing a script like an import script or something like that i mean I'm, I'm sure you're capable of doing that as well but i mean i'm also happy to do that so if there's something coming out of 
um, the van software and it needs to be massaged in such a way that so that it can be easily or more easily imported into Coos. If that's at all straightforward, I'm happy to take that on. Um, so I'll just put that out there. Uh, let's see. I've got, I appreciate that, also be Jeremy. Jeremy. Can you say that again, Jeremy? Uh, I said that uh, at least if it's if you're using Python for that sort of thing, um, I'm pretty decent and would be happy to help get something okay. up and running. And, and what were you saying, Chuck? I was just saying oh. thank you. Cool. All right, uh, Ray, Henry, and Michael. I think the most actionable bits of information here uh, of value have, have to be the people who have identified themselves as willing to provide a loan, people who are willing to give us money, and the people who are willing to pre-subscribe. I think some of the other bits of information are probably not of a high enough percentage uh, for us to um, uh, use uh, to, great, uh, to great value. Uh, we might be able to extrapolate some of that in arguments for our grants and loans with regard to some take rates, um, but um, I think that's a bit of a stretch given the, the low percentage, even though uh, they were happy with 25% and they're probably right with those kind of numbers. But the best bits are the uh, mining of the data of, of the people who are willing to give us the money. Thanks, Ray. And uh, in the interest of time, I'd like to wrap this up after uh, Henry and Michael, so that we can get onto the uh, the RFP and the other some of the other stuff. But Henry, you want to ask your question that you posted in chat, and then Michael. Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, how is the contract written? When are they? Uh, when is Last Mile uh, met all their contractual obligations? Uh, what are the criteria for completing the contract? The contract expired on December 31st. So, so they're still working on the under the contract. So we didn't do any amendment or anything like that. And I have not looked at the last page of the contract to see what the final deliverable was, but um, that would still have to come in. Or, or you know, how did did they have to make a certain number of get a certain number of responses or? anything like that I, I i don't know i mean yeah because the contract's done i was wondering um you know what kind oh, of what they do against what they said they were going to do yeah i don't know you know i you know tim did all the contract negotiations so i need to uh, go back and look at that uh since i guess i'm the last one <laughs> last one standing on this one um so i'll get back to the whole commit the uh, the whole board on that as I, as I recall, there there was like a number of contacts that was expected, and they were and they fell a bit behind in part because we didn't want them to do the door knocking. So yeah, as as far as I can tell, they you know the the date has gone has gone by, but they still have. I mean, they're not done in Duxbury yet. They're not done in Washington yet, or wherever they said they were going tomorrow. So I think yeah, I think they're still on the hook for a bit. But that would be good to look at the contract. I think. All right, um, Michael. Uh, comments on the overlap of the two roles. Um, so s surveys um, tend to be best used for um, grant and loan applications for documenting demand in that sense to, to, make, to make bankers happy and grant awarders happy. And demand aggregation, um, typically is used to get commitments and to, to, to actually market and get people signed up. And what we did here though, is we overlapped them a little more because we only surveyed residents on routes that we've already identified. So there is overlap between the two here and that's why Coos is looking a little less useful because we, we usurped some of its role by, by restricting who we surveyed. So th those are my comments, but I, I still think both roles are important. Um, I'll leave it to check in committee to decide if Coos is still valuable or not. But um, generally demand aggregation is a very useful way to, to get people to commit and, and to rally, rally their neighbors to commit once we're really building and really 
trying to get signups. All right. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Michael. Um, let's move on to the poll inventory RFP. David, you want to take this one too? Yes. Um, I, the committee has been, I think we've gone through by three drafts of this poll inventory um, RFP. Uh, thank you, Ray. Ray is taking a, a major role in getting the whole package together. We've had some good input from a number of members on the committee. Um, and so we think it's pretty in, in, in enough shape that we're bringing it to the board for recommendation to it's a go and we'll issue it not in the next week or two, but with some modifications, we have to hone in on the date that it should be issued and the date that we want responses to come back. I'm of the opinion not to specify a route in this RFP, but to say that we're going to need somebody to do 120 miles of pole inventory to be specified. And we may, by the time we pick a contractor, we'll probably know where we're going to be. But um, I don't, I, Ray and I have gone back and forth on this a couple of times. And now I'm going to let Ray Ray chime in on this one since I'm going to let it sort of be his, his he did such a good job in getting it together and honchoing it. Um, so I think there's three bits to this. One is the RFP itself and whether we're happy with it. And so um, an approval of the RFP. The second bit is an approval to issue the RFP. And the third bit is actually what is phase one? What's the definition, uh, definition of phase one? What are people bidding on? Um, and as you read the uh, read the RFP itself, there were actually two purposes. One is to bid on phase one for getting that work done, uh, and we might uh, we might actually retain one or more contractors to do the work um, to do that. And it's also to identify other folks put under contract that we can do the subsequent phases, uh, but by just issuing a request for bids uh, without going through the entire process of an RFP. Uh, so a request for bids and work orders. Um, I think that I, it had some really good technical input with regard to the uh, statement of work, um, and uh, I think that I think that's looking really good. Uh, so the important bit here now is uh, what is phase one, uh, and I think I just heard David say it's going to be 120 miles and go bid on that, um, or it's going to be um, uh, blue and yellow, and uh, go in, and of course the other part within the RFP itself is that we don't actually identify what phase one is in the contract. People who are interested in knowing what phase one is, they have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, and then they get access to the actual definition of the phase. Uh, on the other hand, um, we could just say do a hundred miles. Um, and what they will probably do is they will do like uh, people have suggested, they'll determine that that means it's going to be a pole every 185 feet or there's 27 poles per mile. And they're gonna tell us that uh, $21 a pole, here's what it's gonna cost you. Uh, that's not an unusual kind of uh, response that they've kind of given us, give you an average of what the cost per pole is. I didn't think we wanted to go that particular way. Um, but I thought we were going to perhaps identify it with a little more specificity. But I think that's a business development committee role in the sense of uh, coming up with a recommendation for the phase one. And so I think we still have that to come back to you with. Um, but the RFP itself is in, in good shape. Um, as David said, depending upon when we get the data together for phase one, will depend upon when the when it's issued and um, when we expect proposals back. My view of the world is that we expect proposals back within, let's say, a period of four weeks from the time we issue it. And so if we were issuing this thing, let's say, one February, we'd be looking at one March to get proposals back, somewhere around there. And uh, then doing a contract award uh, a week or so later, doing the negotiation, signing the contract, and work actually getting underway around 15 March. That would be the timeline that I would see this thing playing out. So <clears throat> I guess I guess what I think we're looking for would be um, uh, one, do you, you feel like the RFP is in decent shape? Secondly, 
uh, do you want us, the business development committee, to come back to you with a phase one definition? David, do you have anything else you want to add? No, that's it. I think for sure we'll come back to the board with a definition, but in terms of issuing the RFP, you know, I think we have some time to define the, you know, further define the route. Okay, so um, so you're looking for a motion to essentially to execute the RFP and start collecting responses. Does that sound right? No, um, I think I think the motion to approve the RFP subject to the approval of uh, the phase one definition. Uh, the issuance would be subject to the approval of the phase one definition. I see, I, I, I disagree. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, the motion's on That's the fine. floor, I'll let the motion go. No, 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 I, 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 didn't, I didn't move, that's why I was okay. asking. I wanna no, make sure I, that I we're all we on the same page. I think we should the RFP with 120 miles and that we'll have the route defined sometime in February. Because I don't want to delay. I mean, this kind of work is pretty routine. It's not like they need to know where in central Vermont they're going to be. Um, but to get, you know, get get responses as quickly as it can. If we wait, I would like to have the poll inventory done by the middle of April, if possible, so that if we go out to bid for the engineering, design, and make ready, all that can happen this summer. I mean, we're the longer we delay on some of these things, the tougher it's going to be to get services in, installed so to the extent that we're gonna you know we we're not ready to give you a route do with 120 we know 64 miles um the rest of the other 60 miles we haven't you know agreed to or or had a recommendation on so the committee can come back to the board with that later um in the meantime i'm, I'm a more bigger advocate of getting the rfp out All right, so I'm going to move that we approve the poll inventory RFP with simply the with 120 miles specified without the route specified. Seconded. Okay. And who was that? Tom, was that you that seconded it? I didn't see. Okay. Seconded by Tom Fisher. Any further discussion? Michael. Um, I, I agree with the motion. I'm going to vote for it. Um, I, if, if I were a bidder on this contract, I would certainly want to know what percentage of poles are easement through the woods, through the fields, and what percentage are on the road. And choosing the routes is going to be important for them to check out before they bid. Otherwise, they will bid higher to cover their butts that there might be a high proportion of easement poles. But if we think we, before the bidding process ends, can identify the routes for them, uh, I agree with the strategy of getting this rolling now. Okay, Ken. Yeah, my my um, question is similar, but can we seek the response from the bidders based on number of polls on on road right of ways versus another you know another part of their bid being number of poles that go through easements fields and woods so that so that maybe you know they can respond without knowing all this the specific perfect route is that yeah. possible to 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 allow that to be a response my guess is we'll get a response that actually bids it that way they'll give you a number for a pole and a right away and a pole that they got to go in the pucker brush uh, on a per pole basis, you know, and, and they may not, they may, they may not give you a final price. I think that's reasonable, but, though. And, and I can actually, we're using the GIS. I can tell how many poles. I've been working on poles in the right of way for another, another project I'm working on. So I can give you a pretty good estimate. <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts or questions on the pole inventory RFP? Um, do do any of you think that we need to change the RFP to specifically ask for um, specifically ask for that breakdown that Ken's suggesting? I I, th I think it might be a good idea to put it out there explicitly so that um, so that it just sort of catches the questions before mm -hmm. they come in. Yep. I'll accept that, man. I'll make 
Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, that's something you can you can probably just do easily enough on your own. Yeah. I don't think that's a that's a super okay. huge lift. Um, I, I think we'll get more hits that way too. That's that sounds great. Any other any other thoughts on the poll inventory RFP? Okay. Hearing no further commentary, um, please signify your approval by saying aye. 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 Um, those opposed, abstentions, or requests for uh, roll call. Okay, motion passes unanimously. There you are. Thank you for putting that all together, Ray. Um, that was uh, there's there's a lot there, and it's it's deep. Um, so uh, as a follow up to all that, and Ray Ray did a great job, Greg. Kelly was actually quite instrumental in some of the things that were added to it. In fact, he added more detail than we were really thinking of, but Greg was really thinking down the line what we need to know later that I said, huh, this is pretty good stuff that I hadn't thought about at all. So there's some great input on that kind of thing. When you build this database, it's a database we're going to be living with for a long time. Very good. So yeah, kudos to Greg then too for uh, for fleshing that out. Um, Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. And Michael. Thanks, Michael. So um, on this same topic, um, Tom Fisher had some commentary and some good ideas taking all of that hard work that uh, that you all worked on. But I'm, so I'm going to turn it over to Tom, and he can explain his uh, his thoughts about this. Thanks. Um, so I guess uh, I don't know how many of you managed to get a chance to, to review the RFP. Hopefully you did, since you just voted on it. Um, but in there, there's some language that um, was borrowed for um, almost any contract having to deal with state grants and, and other state entities. Um, and it deals with things like whistleblower protections and fair employment practices, American with Disability Act adherence, uh, assurance that businesses are in good standing, child support, uh, no gifts um, allowed to well, to the state or in this case, maybe just to be fiber, um, assurance against a debarment, uh, Lots of other things, um, and so in looking through those, I'm thinking, you know, those are things that, as a entity, perhaps we should consider having policies about those as well. Uh, it's nice that in this case we can state, you know, because this might be under Vermont contracts, there's already some some um, verbiage that can go into that. But um, as we do other contracts with outside entities, it would probably behoove us to have that more codified. Um, so. With that in mind, uh, I was thinking to put forward the following motion and I will post it into the chat um, and then read it out loud. Uh, so I move that the policy committee be tasked with reviewing the Vermont state required language from the poll inventory RFP along with our past board approved policies and use these in conjunction to create a living CB fiber policies document that can be referenced as an attachment for future contracts and or by board members as an organization-wide policy guide. Uh, drafts of this document should be provided to each delegate and alternate via email. Any desired changes be submitted directly back to the policy committee for consideration and integration. And a final draft should then be submitted to the full board for acceptance at a future board meeting sometime in quarter one of 2021. <laughs> I, will, I will second that uh, just to get the discussion going. Um, Policy committee folks, what do you, what do you think? Does that seem does that seem reasonable? He's sp specifying a timeline for you. I am uh, speaking as somebody who knows a fair amount about policies. I know very little about contracts, and I think there's a difference between the two. I think. Tom is kind of asking for spe specifics that usually flow from what a broad policy is. So for example, if there's language about not discriminating against uh, various people working under the contract, that's really just a non-discrimination statement that I think we might we might already have in our bylaws, but I'm not sure. So, I think you I think you want somebody who knows a lot about contracts. I mean, raise the guy 
I think, who, who knows more about contracts than anybody else. Um, and I would suggest that he would be the person who can probably best speak to, we to whether this is something that's doable, a good idea, and we have the wherewithal to pull it together. Um, so since I was uh, invited to speak here, um, Tom, short sure answer is yes. I'd be happy to have you know take this into consideration and try to as a member of the policy committee and see if we can massage something into uh, a policy that we could consider and adopt. That works for you. I'm not looking for a ton of work or something. I'm just, I mean, it, a lot of it could be copy and paste at this point and developed over time. I'm thinking, I think I used the word a living document in the in the motion, um, thinking that we can develop this over time. Hopefully 10, 20 years from now when we're all enjoying high speed internet, um, we'll still be, you know, thinking of new policies that might want to be added, but um, just having that as a document that, I mean, you know, we have a constitution written down for a reason, you know? Um, and that it, it made sense to me that as we're now getting to the point of actually writing up contracts, as we're bringing on new um, members, that maybe we should be able to, you know, point to some of the things we believe in and say, look, this is important to us and we're not going to do business with somebody who doesn't have this. I, I, I think one of the difficult things is going to be the stuff that actually doesn't have to be written because we have to remember we're a public entity. So we are we are bound by all the all the responsibilities that are given to any public entity, such as non-discrimination. So I don't know, I don't know the level of detail and specificity you have to get to in a contract for general values. I mean, usually a contract is about the specifics of what you're asking somebody, some work you're asking somebody to perform. I think for the general specifics of the expectations we have for how a company is going to operate, such as non-discrimination, that's probably already covered by state law. But I mean, Ray, tell, tell me if I'm off base here, but I think there's a line between the very specific stuff we want to have in our contracts versus general principles that all public agencies in the state are, are, are bound, to, uh, bound to follow. Yeah, so um, certainly there are state statutes and regulations, things that we can point to. And um, uh, I, I frankly borrowed that language from another contract, another uh, CUD contract that was issued uh, because they were told that they should include it as part of their requirements because all the state contracts included it in their requirements. Um, and I think you're getting to something even broader than that, Tom. And um, I, I'm willing to address and look at those things that, that, and learn from them to see if we can't come up with kind of policies and principles that we think are appropriate for our contracting. So, um, Alan, you're not you're not wrong, and, and Tom, I think is uh, uh, is of a right mind and heart, um, and I'd like to kind of pursue that a little bit. So could I could I maybe like frame this slightly differently? I wonder if we could just like collect these pieces that Tom has identified as being valuable, and rather than maybe calling them a policy or anything like that, we can have the um, governing board um, boilerplate collection. Right. These are pieces that we're going to use in future contracts, and pieces that we're going to use when stating what our expectations are, but so that we don't have to uh, replow the same ground over and over, we can say, this is something that we've all agreed to. We can bring it to the policy committee or the governing board and we can say, this is all things, these are all things that we expect are going to be in future contracts. And we can sort of pick and choose from that. Does that seem amenable, Tom? I mean, I, I know that's not exactly what you're asking for. A lot of it could be. I think there's some things like, for example, if Inter Isle wants to give me a $500 and, and a trip to Hawaii, um, that seems like it shouldn't be accepted. And and um, that's not something that the state's going to just, you know, bump into our normal work. It's something we kind of have to call out. Um, and then I think even with, with any new policies aside, all the past policies we've already created, um, they should be codified and presented so that you know, I mean, I don't think they already are. It's just kind of compiling. Um, 
so that they're available for everybody to understand and, and use for us moving forward. Like how many dollars does a contract have to be before we put it out to RFP and, and all the other various other policies we've created. Okay, um, I, th I think I saw RD's hand up and then Jeremy. RD, go ahead. Uh, just a quick um, informational question. How are we, how are we charter? We are a municipality. We are a communications union district under, there's a specific um, Vermont statute that describes all of the powers that we are, um, we are delegated by the state, uh, very much like any other municipality, but with some other specific differences. So are we chartered by the state? Yes. Okay. Do we and do we have a written charter? I'm sorry. Was this uh, uh, normally uh, the legislature would charter us? Do we have a written charter? If we were so, a corporation, we'd have articles of incorporation. So, do we have a charter? Yes, and it is a. We have uh, articles of organization that include the um, the statutory steps that we took to come into uh, existence pursuant to the to, pursuant to this the statute mm -hmm. um the word charter means something very right. specific under vermont municipal law we do not have a charter per se a municipal charter under for a vermont town so cabot goes and changes its charter and it changes the way that state law behaves just for cabot that does need to be changed that does need to be approved by the legislature and by the uh, select board in that case so we don't have a charter per se, but we have articles of incorporation under 30 VSA mm -hmm. chapter 82 there as uh, Ray post, just posted into the chat. Right, so much, much of the policy boilerplate that, that Tom is uh, referring to might already be in our charter. Okay, not, not, not in the charter, there is no charter. I just want to be clear about this. So it will be as part of our statutory obligations as a municipality, perhaps. Yes, that's true. But Tom's right. The example of Inner Isle writing him a $500 check and saying you should really vote for us, that would be a conflict of interest policy that is not, there isn't a, currently a statute requiring, um, you know, disclosures of, um, a select board member somewhere making the right sort of decision. <laughs> yes, I know. Okay, thank you. That clears that up. All right. You know, um, Jeremy, if if I could just say, I think Tom is is more focused really on what I would think of as procedures than policies. I mean, generally, a policy is something that that you create that is going to govern the way you operate. And that's kind of already been created for us because we're a public entity. So I think what we have to figure out are the procedures that we apply and follow when we go about during, doing our business. And Tom, Tom, has, Tom has suggested, and it's probably not a bad way to address it, he suggested addressing this through having boilerplate contract language that more or less tells contractors when you work for us here are the procedures here are the things we expect you to follow and to and to do what do you think about that tom kind of a, a little bit of a change in language but that it, that we're really talking more about a procedure yeah maybe and as i you know as we discuss it more i realize that maybe there's two different things here i don't know if we need to have the the board member um rules of you know being a board member what, what you can take for gifts and stuff be necessarily part of our contract language um those could be two separate things um and i can see you know i guess i guess more to my point is being able to you know have the handbook have something that we can you know reference when we're as we're making our, our decisions as a board um and then also having something that we can hand to our partners and to anybody else they're working with that kind of says, this is how we expect you to act. 
Okay, so before I call on the next two people here, um, in the interest of time, this, I think these are going to be the last two folks, and it sounds like we are sort of meandering around but don't really have any sort of consensus. This might be the sort of thing that we come back with, or that uh, Tom, you and Alan, or you and uh, Ray kind of think about on your own, perhaps, but um, not sure. We'll see what the board says we, when it comes to a vote. Um, I have Jeremy, Matt, then uh, Tim Sullivan. I was kind of going to say what, or suggest what Tom had already said, but it sounds like two different issues. One is boilerplate contract, and the other is sort of a guiding principles or sort of rules of the road for how, you know, we as a board should behave morally, if you will. Okay, Tim. If we're going down this road, it's a it's a good idea. Thanks, Tom. Um, I just joined the um, a board in my Rhode Island town for uh, the zone, zoning board, and one of the one of these things, along with uh, you know, doing things by the books correctly, and I had to get sworn in over the over the web camera, over the phone, based on however you want to do it. But I would think we would all need to be kind of sworn to this um, in a verbal fashion as well, and attest to it, and repeat repeat the language, and agree to it, so that we're holding ourselves accountable as well. You know, I really do think a lot of this stuff is covered by basic laws like bribery laws and uh, <clears throat> prohibitions against graft. I, 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 think we, I, I think we're trying too hard to invent something that I believe already exists. As a, as a school board member, you know, the, the oath that you take when you're sworn in is, is very, very general. Uh, I can't remember what it is, but <clears throat> I think there's an expectation that you will follow all laws, and those laws include non-discrimination, <clears throat> not taking gifts, and even a number of things. I, I, I'm not a lawyer myself, so I couldn't be, I'm not able to point to specific statutes, but we're not the first people who have encountered the issues that Tom is bringing up. So I, I, I think there must be a way to deal with proper behavior other than our have thinking we have to invent a whole scheme that will guide our behavior. I, I, I think a lot of our behavior is already being, being guided by laws that we might not recognize are out there, but I think they really are. Okay, I'm gonna give the last word to, to you, Tom, if you have any, any thoughts about this. Um, I'm ha still happy to put it to a vote. Um, I just don't know if you've, if you've had any change of heart or anything. Yeah, I, I think there are policies that we've created that are not under law. There's no law about how large our, con or not that I'm aware of, any law that dictates how large our contracts need to be before we put them out to RFP. Um, I don't know if there's a set limit created on what counts as a gift and what doesn't. Uh, I work for a company that has a very large contract for the state of Vermont, and I'm pretty sure that Vermont doesn't dictate what those kind of gifts, but we do have an internal policy that says, you know, this is what's allowed and this is what is not. Um, and whether that's in line with what the state has for its own employees, I have no idea. But um, yeah, I guess I, I'm still of the opinion that it, at the very least codifying the laws that we already, or not the laws, codifying the policies we already have into a place that we can all read them is a sensical thing to do. Um, and also that you know we just be prepared for future contracts with boilerplate so that we're not having to reinvent the wheel every time we go around. I'm happy to amend the motion to kind of spell that out or bring it up at the next board meeting um, in a better spelled out way. It would probably take a little work to divvy that up. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm still of the opinion that there should be something there. Okay, w would you be willing to, to, to retract your motion and bring this back next time around? Um, and we can take another crack at it? Sure. Okay, thanks, Tom. And if that's amenable to everybody rather than voting on this, I mean, it's it, that's a, it's a breach of Robert's rules, but I'm gonna assume that everybody's looking at the clock, blinking down there at them and thinking that this is maybe a good move, Jeremy. Um, yeah, I, I think actually what you've done is, ta is to ask uh, Tom to agree to have the motion tabled for the moment so he can do more work on it. And I, I, that's well within Robert's rules. So I, I don't think we're going off the rails on this one at all. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks for that, Tom. I, I think we, I think we will, um, we will come to a, hopefully a, 
conclusion that everybody is uh, satisfied with. Uh, next up, we have a communications committee report. Chuck? Great. Um, so the biggest thing we have to report since we all last met as a group is that we have a new website live. It's not perfect yet. It has some uh, rough edges here and there, but it is a vast improvement over the last website that we had. Uh, so I would encourage you all to go check it out at cbfiber.net. Uh, feel free to ping me if you find any typos or, or any problems, or if you have any suggestions for improvements. A couple of ongoing activities uh, that are still going in terms of continuing to enhance this, because if you all recall, uh, we actually hired our web developer uh, with a retainer uh, in order to continue to leverage her services over the course of uh, this year. And in doing so, we are currently uh, adding a few enhancements to the website actively. Uh, we are going to enhance a section that will house our RFPs so that we will have a history of RFPs. Um, people will be able to uh, view open RFPs. People will be able to link to the RFPs and, and get that information in a publicly accessible way. We are also creating a dedicated committee section that's going to call out uh, for each committee uh, what is the charter of that committee, uh, and what is the purview and scope of that committee's purpose and role, uh, and who are the members of that committee. Um, and then finally, we are working on figuring out how to make minutes and agendas much more easy to manage because they are not easy to manage there. And as a result, we have about a three month deficit uh, of minutes and agendas <laughs> that have not been posted. Um, and so uh, we're working on streamlining, streamlining that process, also making them easier to consume so they don't show up like blog posts. They're in a nice easy table where you can go and, and kind of get them quickly and easily. Um, so there is definitely a lot of evolution to come on the website, um, but uh, I would encourage you to go all go check it out because, again, I think it's a vast improvement over what we did have. All right. Any questions for Chuck? Communications committee stuff. I do have I do have one other item, but I just want to pause there on the website. Oh, okay. Okay, um, not not seeing anybody asking any questions or, or adding commentary. Um, I oh, oh, go ahead, Tim. You are on mute, Tim. All right, S slow Chromebook. I'm on here. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I know I know where .net cvfiber.net. Um, did we look look and reach to see if we could also own the .org? We own both the .org and the .com. Uh, I have not instituted redirects to the .net yet. It's on the to-do list. So that will, that will get into play soon enough. OK, thanks. Anything else about the website, folks? Look, looks beautiful. Love the, love the graphics. Great. Um, so the well, only Chuck's other going. item, the only other item I just want to point out is uh, the communications committee is going to be working on another update soon enough uh, to be distributed to various communities. Um, we did not get one together uh, as we had. Uh, uh, we actually had a hearty debate about what an update at the end of the year might have included because mostly what we had to share was kind of bad, bad news, um, and the the CARES extension was still up in the air, so we didn't have anything concrete we could share there yet. Um, that said, uh, I do think uh, towards the end of this month, we will have an update that has some meat that's worth sharing. Um, so look for that. We'll be, we'll be working on that and, and bringing that to the broader board soon enough. All right. Thanks, Chuck. So now any questions for, for Chuck? All righty. Moving along. The last, last thing I just want to say is thank you to everyone who contributed. The website was uh, an incredible 11th hour effort, and it would not have been possible without all of you who contributed and pitched in. So, so thank you for everyone who did so. All right, business development committee report, David. Yeah. So I've talked a lot tonight about business development activities, but in line with what Chuck mentioned, we are developing a charter that goes that will be onto the website and also proposing a name change in the committee composition. 
that we'll be bringing back to the full board at the next meeting. We're gonna what I sent out today was just that's what I'm you know starting as a draft and um, trying to shift some of the responsibilities to other committees and um, we'll see how that goes. We also said that we'd probably ha always have one member from the business future planning and development committee to be on the other committees in the in the organization. The other news for business development is is a meeting next week with uh, EC Fiber, uh, no, ValleyNet, Kingdom Fiber, and WEC, with WEC. WEC is going to its board um, a few days later to get from board approval to go to the Public Utilities Commission mm. to borrow money to do fiber. Um, so that meeting's coming up. And the other, uh, there's one other thing that business development's doing, but it's slipping my brain right now. Um, I don't think I have it. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to let it go. I'll have to let you know. I hope you guys don't mind me sending you emails. <laughs> nope, send them away. So, yeah, no, the, oh, the, and maybe I did mention this. Uh, the fiber line going from East Cal East Montpelier to Maple Corner substation will be a reusable fiber line. It's going to be six miles long. Um, going through a good chunk of callus. So looking forward to being able to not have to pay for that fiber. All righty. Any questions for David or business development committee stuff? Any volunteers? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Always taking more volunteers, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, round table. Let's start with Ray. Yes. Josh? <laughs> uh, I'm all set. Thanks. I appreciate it. All right. Chuck? Thank you, everyone. All right. Uh, Jeremy? I second what Chuck said. OK. <laughs> David? I forgot the most important thing, money. So Rob Fish from the department, I think I sent this out, I, I quoted 750,000. They got a million dollars from Northern, Northern Border Regional Commission to be dished out to CUDs for construction and management. And they're gonna add that to the one and a half million dollars that they have now. They have not drafted the application RFP yet, but um, whether all eight CUDs are gonna be able to use this money this year, because the one and a half million was authorized for this fiscal year, which ends on July 1st. Um, so that was the one thing I forgot and I wanted to bring up. And um, the other one was the grant application we made last year for CUD for doing fiber to the premise for Northfield, Roxbury, and Moortown. That that um, final version, whatever we're going to have to do to just modify the Moortown thing, uh, Rob has not told me what we need to do to do that. but. They're pretty happy with what we proposed earlier, so we'll see how that goes. I knew I'd forgotten two things. <laughs> I'm glad you remembered it. Jeremy? A real quick question. Is that specific to the VIGA match funding? Yes. The, that, the, the, okay. the two and a half million dollars now is considered to be used for the VIGA match. Yep. All right. Good question. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lowry? <clears throat> I'm all set. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Larry. Uh, Jerry? Uh, just that the uh, treasurer and the finance committee will be working with the business development committee to get those uh, grant applications out on time so that we're first in line or as close to it as possible. Sounds great. Alan? I actually had a question. Are we still under the cone of silence that's imposed by RDOF, or are we now allowed to talk about things that appear to be happening on our streets with certain kinds of trucks with huge cables behind them, uh, trying to figure out what whether our, the RDOF work is actually starting to, to happen uh, around our area? So that's a good question. And Michael, you're next in, in line. So I think you can probably answer that at least partially. All right. I, I was going to finally pass for once. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I can. Um, Alan, the, 
The prohibited communications rule ends on January 29th at 6 p.m. Um, a lot of the information is already out and therefore can be discussed because the FCC released it, but not everything. Um, any construction you see right now um, is probably unrelated to RDOF, although some companies, I suppose, could be anticipating what they're going to do later and getting a jump, but I, I really doubt that. That's probably other funded construction. Um, I, I can, I think I've, I told the business development committee meeting three weeks ago, um, what our consortium won. Um, I can repeat that again tonight, Jeremy. I don't know if I ever said it directly to the board. I, I seem to remember it coming in an email. I mean, like with what, with what went to whom, um, does, but I don't know. I, I'm on more distribution lists than, than everybody here probably, but to, would anybody else like to see what that information or hear that information from Michael? I've seen it. This is Jerry. It's been, it's been sent around. I don't oh. know if David sent it or Michael sent it or both of them sent it, but I'm, can you say that again, Alan? I think it was just I just think it was just to the committee, Jerry, if I remember right. And both of you were on that committee. That's why you both saw it, I believe. And that could be Michael. Okay. Yeah, if, if you want to sh share it with the whole group, that would be well, I think what, what just, what's happening for some just, of us. Whether or not to say it, let me just say it again quickly. Um there um uh, BC Fiber won um, uh, quite a few towns, uh, census block groups, um, in CV Fiber territory. I believe there were there were two or three census block groups that they won in the southern part of our district. Um, Kingdom Fiber in our consortium also won a considerable number. Um, most of it is in the north, but five towns in CV Fiber territory. Um, CV Fiber itself did not bid, WEC did not bid, uh, Vermont Electric Co-op did not bid. So those are all the members of our bidding consortium. Um, the five towns the Kingdom Fiber won were um, Plainfield, half of Callis, Cabot, um, trying to remember, half of East Montpelier, Middlesex, is that all of them, David? I think so. There were five five towns. And AC Fiber, I think, was I forget now. Was it Williamstown and uh, they didn't get Washington? I think that's Barrytown. It. Um and a piece of Barrytown, that's right. So details about that can come out at the end of the month. So at this point, we can't talk about what we see on a map that consolidated one. Is that correct? No, no we, we can. can. We can talk about yeah, we, can. we can talk about which census block groups consolidated one because that's public information as well. What we can't okay. talk about is 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 implications. We can't talk about post auction market structure. We can't talk about bidding and bidding strategies. Those are the things that are still prohibited. But we can, we can talk about who won what. Can we can we speculate about the impact of certain blocks that were won by um, by for-profit companies? How that might impact the work that we've been working on? Uh, you're free to speculate all you want. I don't dare um, go that way because that, that <laughs> Thanks is for the answer. communication. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I'll give you a call. Idea. I'll give you a call at 6:15 on January the 29th p.m. <laughs> okay, you, you and several other I'll people. I'll be on the call. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as long as it's not a quorum, folks. All right. Um, anything else, Michael, that you wanted to add aside from uh, answering that? No, I still pass. <laughs> okay. All right, Tom. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I know I brought up a, you know a nest to stir um and i recognize having you know been through this since the beginning 
that there has been a lot of that through the years. And uh, part of my effort here is to make sure we don't keep going through those discussions over and over again. That it's just codified. We point to it, say there it is, and we move on. Um, and I, I hope I'm not, you know, I, I really don't want to drag down our meetings with with more of that kind of talk. And that's why the motion was worded as it all goes to the policy committee and they do the work there. Um, so hopefully, you know, not too many more of those. I will bring it up again next time. But um, yeah, that's it. All right. Thanks, Tom. RD. Okay, RD is good to go. Ken? Yes. I pass. All right. Katharina? I pass. Thank you. Henry? Everyone's doing so much great work. Um, it's it's really amazing to see. And Michael, if you could send out that more detailed breakdown to the group, um, I'd appreciate it. I, I only saw it as NRTC, and um, this seems to break open the egg inside of that. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Uh, Tim? I'm sorry I was late and I joined about seven o'clock, so I won't I won't steal too much time, but I would uh, be looking forward to the information David would send out for each town with the survey results. And I'll catch up with uh, looking at the minutes of the meeting after for what I missed. All right. Sounds good. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. I, we don't have a scheduled date for another governing board meeting, but if I had to, if I had to guess, we may be meeting again on the 26th. Um, I will try to give you as much notice if uh, we think that's necessary. But uh, alrighty, have a good rest of your night, and we'll talk to you later. Good night.